Like Bill said, I'm Martha and I'm the Heritage Collection Manager at for the Evelyn Lehman Culp Heritage Collection at the Napanee Center and the Napanee Public Library. Um, if you didn't know, the Napanee Public Library actually has a branch, which is the Napanee Center that houses the Heritage Collection. We started in 1971 um, and housed 40,000 items of Napanee history. And it started in the basement of the library. And in 2007, the city uh, gave us a place to call home with 10,000 square feet and a historical home. Um, in 1989, it was renamed the Evelyn Lehman Call Heritage Collection. And after our founder and library director, she always said that uh, she always heard people hate history and it was her goal to make people love them. So that's our goal at the Napanee Center and with the Heritage Collection. We're one of six museums in the state of Indiana that are owned and managed by a public library. Um, like I said, we house 40,000 items of Napanee history that include the Doug Grant Family Gallery of the um, Emma Schrock Collection, an Air Force One display, Hoosier Cabinets, a state-of-the-art cartoonist exhibit, and a historical home, uh, the, John, the uh, historic John Hartman House that's actually attached onto our building, and you enter through our building. Um, and so much more. We have a couple big programs that we do. We do Night at the Museum every Oct second Saturday of October, where we literally shut down all the lights and bring Napanee history to life with volunteers. So it's very, if you love the movie, it's very much like the movie. Uh, we also have a podcast called Evie's History Bites, which Bill has actually been on. Uh, talking about the Ruth Mir and Haviland Beardsley House. And that's available on all uh, podcasting platforms and it releases every last Wednesday of the month. Um, then we also have our Hit the Pavement in Historic Napanee program going on right now. Uh, those are our walking tours. So every Thursday, there should be one going on right now. Um, at 10 and 5.30, we leave from the library and we cover different topics of Napanee history. It's also available on the App Pocket sites, uh, seven of those walking tours that we do. Um, so first off, I'm going to share a couple quotes by a couple of our cartoonists. Um, Bill Holman, who is the creator of Smokey Stover, said, It seems to me it's the Indiana wind. I am firmly convinced that a state that produced such men as jo George Aid, Booth Tarnikin, and Hoagie Carmichael can't help pr produce other men of humorous talent. And another one of our cartoonists, Fred Neer, also said, Being born and raised in the mid Middle West in Indiana had a lot to do with the type of humor I worked with. Homie, the next door type, and always felt everyone liked to see themselves in the mirror. So first off, I'm going to talk about some fun facts about our cartoonists, and then I'm going to talk about them individually. So Napanee has the distinction of having the most cartoonists in the whole United States per capita of any city our size. The cartoonists all knew each other. Um, so Meryl Blosser and Mike Parks lived across the street from each other, which coincidentally was like f within 500 feet of the museum. Near, uh, Fred Near and Bill Holman worked at the Five and Dime together, and they would also go to Parks' home to see his work and his correspondence courses. Three worked in Cleveland together at one time. Uh, Meryl Blosser would visit Napanee often after his success, and Max Gwynn being the number the youngest would have known the older five. Um, a lot of people often will ask us why we have so many successful cartoonists. And that would be because of an art teacher named Bessie Brown. She taught um, art at Napanee High School and was also a grade school uh, teacher. She encouraged doodling, which often got the cartoonists in trouble in school, which I'll talk mention um, what happened to one of our cartoonists because of his doodling. And um, she is known to have taught Blosser, Most, Parks, uh, Holman, and Near. And um, like I said, many believe that she is the reason behind their success. She served on the first public library board in Napanee in 1919, and she taught nearly 25 years in Napanee and then went on to teach in Goshen and Indianapolis before um, coming back and um, retiring in the Mishawaka area. 
Another thing that the cartoonists did was they did correspondence courses, and a big correspondence course in the um, early 1900s was the Landon School of Illustrating and Cartooning. This was a mail order car uh, correspondence course, and uh, Meryl Blosser, Henry Moss, Mike Parks, Fred Neer, and Bill Holman all participated in this mail order course in which the Landon course actually knew that there was so many cartoonists taking this course and becoming popular and becoming syndicated because they actually use them in their advertisements. So I have one of the advertisements that um, they used and um, if you can't read it, it says four successful Landon students um, from one village. And that mentions um, Meryl Blosser, uh, Henry Moss, Mike Parks, and then um, Fred Neer. So this was a course that you would um, cop, it would be uh, advertised in like popular mechanics, newspapers, everything like that. And it would say, um, answer this ad by copying this sketch. And then you would be enrolled in the correspondence courses. Charles Landon um, was also the creator of the Newspaper Enterprise Association. And the Landon School was thought to have revolutionized the way of cartooning. There's a really cool YouTube video if you um, like put into the search bar Landon School of Illustrating and Cartooning that will actually pop up and it does a great explanation of how Landon revolutionized cartoons and cartooning and um, really utilizing the post office system. Max Gwynn would have taken another correspondence course, but not Landon's. So the first cartoonist of the Napanee Six would be Merrill Blosser. He was born in Napanee in 1892, and his father owned the first shoe store. And at the age of 12, he won an essay contest called How Would You Invest $500? With that, he was able to, he won a free trip to Washington, D.C., and he was able to meet Pre President Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he drew a picture of Teddy Roosevelt while he was meeting him, and it was said that Teddy Roosevelt uh, called him a bully, but uh, kept, but encouraged him to keep on drawing. At the age of 16, though, he was expelled from Napanee High School because he drew a picture of the devil and put... <laughs> He put the principal's name under it. <laughs> so while Miss Brown encouraged doodling, uh, a lot of the other teachers did not appreciate it. He worked in Baltimore, West Virginia, uh, at the Cleveland Plain Dealer and at the newspa uh, newspaper Enterprise Association with uh, Charles Landon. He attended the Academy of Fine Arts of Chicago and his uh, most famous comic strip was Freckles and His Friends, which ran from 1915 to 1973, and is the only cartoon to reach its 50th anniversary still under the personal direction of its creator. It reached 22 million readers through 500 daily and Sunday newspapers, and one time he wanted to name a horse, so he asked his readers to send him suggestions. He got 24,000 suggestions um, to name a horse. And he often used Napanee as inspiration with Freckles and his friends, and he passed away in 1983 in California. One of his inspirations was actually his little cousin, Henry Zipster. Henry actually lived in Wakarusa, but he was Merrill's cousin. And in 1935, at a family reunion, Merrill approached him and asked if he would like to appear in the funny papers. And he was only eight or nine years old at the time and told Merrill that he wasn't sure. So Merrill went and talked to his parents and they gave their blessing. Not long after the family reunion, Henry Zipster started appearing in Freckles and His Friends as Freckles' best friend, Lard Smith. Um, so I don't know if you can see, he has that little tuff right there and this is Lard right here. So he has that similar tuff um, and pudgy face like Henry. So here are some examples of Merrill's work. Um, I actually should have put, we do have one where it mentions a hardware store that was in Napanee. Yeah. 
And then here's some as um, an artist, Teddy Roosevelt. We have a couple Teddy Roosevelts in our collection of Merrill. Um, and then this one was for the shoe store um, advertisements. So next up we have Henry Moss and he was born in 1895 in Napanee and he grew up just north of the former Amish Acres property. He graduated from Napanee High School in 1913 where he was the cartoonist and artist of the yearbook. So all of, his, all of the doodles and cartoons in the yearbook were his. Um, his family said that he always carried a notebook to draw in and he filled it with drawings of farm animals, milk cans, and anyone who would pose for him. He actually started his career at the South Bend News Times to be trained to do cartoons and to be a reporter. Um, he decided that reporting wasn't for him, so then he went to work at the Cleveland Plain Dealer with Merrill Blosser. Um, in 1917, he moved to Chicago to work for Lord and Thomas Advertising Agency, and he attended the Chicago Art Institute Night School. And he did commercial art for Swift Ham, Kraft Foods, General Mills, um, and many more. And in 19 20, he set up his own studio in Chicago, and by 1922, he received uh, a gold medal at the New York Art Directors Club Expedition in New York City for painting a baked ham for Swift and Company. He passed away in 1994 in Woodstock, New York, and it was said that he never liked flying, so his family would actually act have to go pick him up and drive him back and forth whenever he came back to Napanee. Um, so there's an example of a swift ham that he would have painted. Um, the Morning Lady is one of our only cartoons that we have that was drawn by him, and it's actually a little tiny postcard. Um, and then here's some examples, again, for Swift and Company, and then uh, General Mills, which the pictures don't do these justice um, as they do in person. Um, he also, we also have a painting that he did of his wife, Hilda, um, that is in our historical house. Uh -huh. And we have like, we actually have like images of the food too that he like painted. Yeah. But they're too big, they're like huge, so we can't get them on our scanner bed. Um, next we have Francis Parks, which he moved to Napanee when he was in the eighth grade. And because his father was a Presbyterian minister, so he came to be the minister at the Presbyterian Church in Napanee. He graduated Napanee High School uh, in 1917. He was a pro uh, cartoonist for the yearbook and the president of the senior class. His newspaper friends actually tagged him as Mike because they didn't like Francis or Franny. His little sister actually called him Franny. Um, and if he attended the Academy of Fine Arts in Chicago and studied under Carrie Orr, who was an editorial cartoonist for the uh, Chicago Tribune. His first job was at the Cleveland Press, and on the advice of Merrill Blosser, he went to work for the Newspaper Enterprise Association. So he drew more political, sports, current films, and historical cartoons that had heart, humor, and a story. And we actually also have um, he did a couple like books about Nebraska um, and the history of Nebraska and there's he drew all of the cartoons and things like that because his daughter had a, a school project so he decided to take it to the next level. Uh, many famous individuals requested the cartoons that they appeared in like Winston Churchill, uh, Harry Truman, Jim Farley, J. Edgar Hoover, and Richard Nixon, and he passed away in 1979 in California. So here's some of his editorial cartoons. And as you can see, his tagline is Mike Parks, not Francis. Um, and then here's some more. And there's Winston Churchill making an appearance right there. So next we have Bill Holman. He's probably the most famous of all of our cartoons, uh, cartoonist, and he was born in 1903 in Crawfordsville, Indiana. So Crawfordsville actually also claims him 
as one of their own, but he came to live in Napanee when he was two years old. He always wanted to be a fireman, and he worked at the Five and Dime next to the Blossers shoe store where he sold popcorn, and he would actually take the brown paper that they would wrap your shoes in and practice drawing on it. He left high school at the age of 16 and started at the Chicago Academy of Arts, but he left at soon after because he was hungry and needed a job, so he went to work at the Chicago Tribune. An early uh, strip of his was called Billville Birds, but it was canceled. Um, but with that strip, he was able to make $35 a week so he could finally eat. <clears throat> Um, his main cartoons were Smokey Stover, which ran from 1935 to 1978, Nuts and Jolts, and then Spooky the Cat, which Spooky often appeared in a lot of Bill's cartoons in the background. And he passed away in 1987 in New York City. So with Bill, the word foo became a household name. When he was asked how he came up with the word foo, he said that it he needed a name for a car, and it just came to him. He was thinking to himself, foo, that's what I'll call the car. Um, with that and the popularity of Smokey Stover and Chief Cashew Nut always uh, going to fight fires in their comic strips, there were foo cl clubs created um, in 1941. We know that there was the Order of Smokey Stover in Redmond, Oregon, foo dances, foo songs, um, the song, What This Country Needs Is Foo, is actually on YouTube and you can listen to it. Um, it is pretty funny. Um, and then Smokey Stover also appeared in a Bruce Springsteen song, Jambalaya, which the line is, she's built like Marilyn Monroe and she walks like Smokey Stover. Um, Foo Fighters of World War II, they were used to identify UFOs and other oddities in the sky were actually called Foo Fighters because um, the, um, the person in charge loved Smokey Stover, so he just wanted to call them the Foo Fighters. Um, in the book, the, 90, the 37th Parallel by Ben Mesrick mentions Smokey Stover and how the Foo Fighters got their name. And if you really, really want to like try and connect the dots and do seven degrees of separation, you can say that the band, the Foo Fighters, also used Smokey Stover as their inspiration, even though they were named, um, they took their name from the World War II Foo Fighters. During World War II, Bill served as a master of ceremonies for a USO show, and Smokey and Spooky actually appeared on sides of planes during World War II. And I was looking at this one a little bit closer yesterday, and I actually think that that's Chief Cashew Nut also. And then because of Smokey Stover, the Foo Car came into existence. Um, there is an earlier one that actually had three wheels, but the Foo Car is Smokey Stover's fire, fire truck. It was two, it would go down the road on two wheels. And there was 500 kits made by a gentleman in Francisville, Indiana, which that's food car number one. And we only know that there are possibly five in existence. And the museum is actually lucky to have one on loan to us from our fire department um, because our fire department found one at auction in the early 1990s. And they um, used to use it in parades, so it was drivable. Um, the steer it has a steering wheel, but the steering wheel is fake. It's hydraulics. Um, it's completely balanced on two wheels. We don't use anything to prop it up. Uh, but it actually did appear in popular mechanics for the mechanisms that are used to keep it balanced and driving down the road. Um, the Foo Car, our Foo Car, retired in 2010 um, and became a permanent part of the museum um, exhibits. So here's some nuts and jolts, and then um, Bill did a self-portrait of himself, kind of being a funny guy, and he had a lot of private jokes. So um, there's Notary Sojak right there. Um, supposedly, it means Merry Christmas in Gaelic, but I haven't been able to 
figure that out and every single time I put into Google Translate, um, it doesn't come out Notary So Jack. Um, so that could possibly be another thing that he made up. Um, and then right here, there's 1506 Nix Nix that appeared in a lot of his cartoons and it was a private joke that he had with other cartoonists. Um, and he just liked to use a lot of puns and things like that, like scram gravy ain't wavy. Um, he also did birthday cards for people. Um, there's another nuts and jolts, which I think Spooky actually, yep, Spooky, the cat is right there. Um, coming down the ban coming down the steps with them. And then we have Fred Neer. He was born in 1903 in Napanee, and he regarded Merrill Blosser as his inspiration to becoming a cartoonist. He graduated from Napanee High School in 1921, where he was the cartoonist of the yearbook. He worked at the Five and Dime with Bill Holman, but instead of selling popcorn, he sold ice cream. His first cartoon he sold for $2 at the age of 12, and he is the only cartoonist that we know how old he was when he took the landing course and he was 14 years old. His cartoons often contained names of Napanee residents for his cartoon characters. Um, he had a comic strip called Us Moderns and it was about babies. And so if he liked your name or he knew your parents or things like that, sometimes your name would appear on the plaques of the baby beds. So uh, I just had somebody come to me the other month and they're like, oh, I still have that cartoon that my name appeared in uh, with Fred Neer. He attended the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. Um, his main cartoon was Life's Like That which was from 1934 to 1974, and it was syndicated in 250 to 300 newspapers. Famous people requested his work, uh, President Roosevelt, Eisenhower, and Nixon, and he taught a cartooning course at the University of Colorado. So um, Anapani and U the University of Colorado actually share his collection of works. He passed away in 2001 in Boulder, Colorado. So here are some of his individual cartoons, um, like Molly and William. And then he also drew Shelly Ann. Um, but here's Life's Like That, which I think Shelly Ann is in this one. So our youngest cartoonist was Max Gwynn, and he was born in 1924, and he's the only cartoonist to have stayed in Napanee. He kept his, um, he kept his studio in Napanee and really came back after World War II and going to art school to uh, put down roots. He received a little $2 cartooning course as a Christmas present one year. And he graduated from Napanee High School in 1942, where he was a cartoonist for the yearbook and the senior class president. He served in the Navy during that time and continued to take correspondence courses to fine tune his craft. And he attended the Academy, or the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, which he would have told you that him and his wife lived in a trailer in a lady's backyard because they were that poor, but he needed to attend school. Um, he also did commercial advertising art for Campbell's, Chortime Brock, and other local businesses in the area. And he drew Slim and Spud from 1955 to 1996, which that appeared in The Prairie Farmer. He created Rolo the Rotor Rooter Man and drew him for 25 years for the Rotor Rooter Company. He drew Floyd's Farm Supply, which appeared in the Feed and Farm Supply magazine. Pig Trough appeared in The Prairie Farmer, and he sold cartoons to over 300 publications that included The New Yorker, The Saturday Evening Post, and Cosmopolitan. And he wrote gags for many other cartoonists, including the creator of Dennis the Menace, Hank Ketchum, which we actually have a little note from Hank saying, thanks for my gags. Um, he passed away in 2014. So here's Pig Troft and Slim and Spud. So um, Max very much um, did a lot of farm um, 
and farming in his cartoons. And then here's one that would have appeared in um, magazines. So I just told you about six great men in cartooning and who were famous across the board. Um, but what if I told you that there was supposed to be a seventh? Um, so Harrison Hostler was supposed to be Napanee's seventh cartoonist. He was born in 1908 in Napanee and graduated in 1927 from Napanee High School. He was a cartoonist of the yearbook and he would have had Bessie Brown um, in like middle school or in grade school as a teacher. He studied at the Chicago Institute of Fine Art and studied cartooning with the cartoonist of the Chicago Tribune, but he left school and never finished so that he could take care of his dad. He worked at Vitrus Steel Products Company in Napanee, where he created designs for porcelain top tables and would draw and cut his own stencils. And he would actually paint on the porcelain too. So we have a couple of his paintings on porcelain. And then he went on to design the current Living Gospel Church in Napanee that actually sits on the block behind the museum. Prior to the, it becoming the Living Gospel Church, it was the first Brethren Church, and that church had burnt down in 1948, and Harrison was asked to design a new church. Um, he didn't know anything about designing a building, but he said through the help of God and his talent, he was able to design a gorgeous building, which it is all, actually the front is entirely limestone, um, and it's probably one of the coolest buildings that you're not gonna find on the main street in Napanee. And he passed away in 1957. So here's one of his cartoons that we actually have, and we have a couple others also. So this would be of um, the yard at Vitrus Steel. So the cartoonist's legacy. In 2005, the Napanee Public Library actually installed a historical marker outside of the library to um, commemorate our six cartoonists. The library's collection is also very um, robust and we're always still collecting cartoons. One year, the founder of the Heritage Collection, Evelyn Culp, wrote to each individual cartoonist asking for cartoons to put on display. They sent her cartoons, and while we're still collecting cartoons, we have over a thousand cartoons collectively from all of them that include advertisement prints and paintings, and many of them are originals. In 2020, through a generous donation given by Doug Grant, we were able to create an exhibit for the cartoonists that gave them a proper place in the museum. Um, it also gave us the ability to preserve our comics. So we hardly have any comics and cartoons on display anymore. And then the Napanee Fire Department was, um, is the only fire department in the United States that gets to use Smoky Stover. So they're not the Napanee Fire Department to us in Napanee. They're actually the Napanee Smoky Stovers. And each of our fire engines have a different design of Smoky Stover on them. So they vary a little bit. In 1962, Fire Chief Willard Naylor asked to use Smoky Stover logo for the fire department. And Bill wrote back and said, you may use my stuff in any way that you see fit. So ever since 1962, they've just been the Smoky Stovers. So as you can see, Navani is a really funny town. Um, and we had a lot of fun um, men come out of Napanee. And then this is our current, our new um, cartoon exhibit. So they each have a panel um, explaining their works. Um, and this actually, if you can see it, this sign that says Home of Freckles actually hung in a tree right across the street from the museum. 